All right. Praise you, family. Praise the Most High Yah. Praise Yah. I'm getting to a been in past few weeks, past few times that I've ministered, been on the subject of uh, the tabernacle of uh, David, been dealing with many facets of it. And I was kind of concerned, you know, and Pastor, you know, just Most High Yah had dropped in his spirit, you know, to go to New Orleans real quick, you know, and I was kind of like, well, Most High Yah, where are we going now? So he said, he dropped this into my spirit, and I'm going, baptism? See, yeah, I thought I was going to go into the captivities of Israel. But for, for the most part, I think this is kind of an entrance into it. You know, as we are going on in Christ, the trials, the tribulations, the things that we suffer as saints together, the things we suffer in our life, it, it kind of brings us, you know, into a, a maturing factor in our walk with the Most High. And then, you know, our daily Daily, daily living, it, it always starts off with the death. We've got to choose whom this day we're going to serve. Baptism is not a, uh, uh, just a one-time thing. It is an ongoing and uh, ever-increasing thing in our, in our lives. It, it, it entails death, burial, and resurrection. And we've got to deal with that each and every day. So I just want to bring in about baptism here. It's uh, about our people of Israel what they went through for them to get mature, for them to uh, become a, a people for the Most High Ah. You know, he brought them down into Goshen with a uh, seven years of uh, drought and seven years of nothing. You know, everything had dried up. There was famine in the land and everything. He got them down into Goshen just to start his people, just to start his nation as a very little seed. And down there in Goshen is where the nation started flourishing. And they got to flourishing to a point to, you know, there was a, a pharaoh that rose up that knew not Joseph. So you got a, a nation here having not, neither, you know, no law, not none, done no good, no evil, being brought into a captivity of the Egyptians for some reason. It's amazing how the Most High I used Joseph as the entrance, as the door for that, because his name, in essence, means he will add. So the Most High God does unique things, you know, the way He has laid this out, especially in the Scriptures, from a shadow perspective and bringing us into what we're now living in, the very image. So on that, you know, baptism, let us get into that with a, you know, a greater understanding. Hopefully that's, that is my uh, thoughts and my hearts for this. Praise the Most High. I'm going to go ahead and change mics, Brother Doug. We online? Everybody hear me? Praise the Most High Yah. Baptism. Go to Romans 6. Romans 6. Bless you all out there on online church. Pray all is having a peaceful Shabbat. But all is well, we have ceased from our labors, done all our labels, done all our works for six days, and now we rest and uh, get our minds on the Most High Yah. That in itself, getting our minds on Him, is a rest. Hallelujah. There's certain verses that are read, if, me, if, if a lot of y'all we here have witnessed many baptisms, and a lot of scriptures that are read during baptisms. But, you know, I just want to get into you know, a little deeper understanding because there's more, like I said, you know, that what's taught out there, that baptism is a one-time thing. You do it and then it's left behind. No, like I said, it is an ongoing process. It's a day-by-day -day thing. It's a day-by-day -day action. It's something that's going on in our lives day by day. And one of the verses that are read in the section of verses is in Romans 6. Starting at verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? And we understand who the we are. Family of the Most High Yah, Israel. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Next verse says, Yah forbid, God forbid. How shall we that are what? Dead to sin. See, that's an aspect of baptism. 
being dead to sin, but we got to work up to that death. Live any longer than live in what? Sin. If we're dead to it, how can we live in it if it's already death, already been pronounced for the sin? That you know, Where there's no life, how can sin prosper? If in death, can sin prosper? No. It has to take some for it. It comes to steal, kill, and destroy. As the wages of sin is what? Death. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, what? Were baptized into what? His death. Baptized into what? Into. I mean, there was an entrance. An entrance. When we were baptized, we were made an entrance into the very same likeness of his death. Death to the flesh. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So you can understand why I get death, burial, and then the last one, resurrection. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ, what was raised up, and it's the only way that we can be raised up is through death, through baptism, because, I mean, there's many facets throughout the day that we've got to die to something going on in our flesh, something going on in our mind. We've got to die to it because, you know, there's parts of our being, parts of our flesh that wants to attach to it, that wants to, you know, adhere to it and sup with it and go living lascivious with it, going taking off in many tangents of this, Sinful, lustful life. But we've got to die to the deeds of this flesh. That's an all-encompassing baptism. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. That's the vehicle, how we are buried with him. Into, there again, entrance, death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, we partake of the same thing, should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, what now all this is through the vehicle of what? Baptism. We shall be also in the likeness of what? His resurrection. Knowing this, the semicolon, and it goes into a deeper meaning of what this resurrection is. He is knowing that our old man is what? Crucified. It's paled. It's put on that, that stake with him. That the what? The body of sin might be, there's that word might though, might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Now I'm going to take another uh, rendering of this same verse out of an interlinear Greek New Testament. This is a Barry's interlinear. New Testament. I'm going to read the same verses again. Now listen. This interlinear uh, Greek New English New Testament is actually the received text that the King James Bible was written from. And I'm going to read it verbatim as it was written in Greek, completely straight trans, uh, transliterated, transformed into the English before it actually was rephrased in the King James Bible. It says, What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it not be. Who, we who died to sin, how still shall we live in it? Or are ye ignorant that as many as we were baptized into Christ Jesus, into his death, we were baptized? We were buried together. We were buried therefore with him by baptism unto death. That as was raised up Christ from among the dead by the glory of the Father, so also we in newness of life should walk, for it conjoined, for it conjoined, we have become in the likeness of his death. So also of his resurrection we shall be. This knowing that old 
our man was crucified with him that might be annulled the body of sin that no longer be subservient we to sin. Amazing how it is written there, huh? Same rendering in the scriptures. This, I think, this is the 1998 version here. I'm going to read it then. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? Let it not be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you, know, do you not know that as many of us as were immersed in into Messiah, Yeshua, were immersed into his death. We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death, that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also of the resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was impaled with him, so that the body of sin, what might be rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. So it's amazing how this opens up just in this little aspect, huh? Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And right there I have the words, were baptized into his death. It's written there two times. Look at that. In the Greek, word rendered 907, baptizo. It says from a derivative of 911. And we'll understand that this is going to start interleaking here together. To make whelm that is fully wet, used only in the New Testament of ceremonial ablution, especially technically of the ordinance of baptism. Baptist, baptize, wash. Again, when it says it's come from a derivative of 911, let us go to 911. A primary verb to whelm that is cover wholly what? With a fluid. Again, in the New Testament, only in a qualified or specific sense. I'm not going to solely take that as a good definition. Only in a qualified, this is out of a lexicon. Only in a qualified or specific sense, that is literally to moisten a part of one's person or by imp implication to stain. And notice there I have to stain, pretty much a uh, bolden. As with a dye dip. So there's something going on more with baptism than we actually realize. There's more going on in the spirit than what is actually witnessed in the physical. First Corinthians ten. First Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers, and who is our? Israel, people of the Most High Isle, were under the cloud, and all passed, what? Through the sea. Because that was a time when they were fleeing from their enemies. And the only thing that separated them from their enemies was passing through the sea. And Moses had to be the mediator for them to stand in place of them, to pray to do the Most High Oz will and to part the waters and then to lead the people through the waters. But it's notice here in verse 2. And it says, And all... And were all baptized. Who was? All that passed through the sea. Unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. But how in the world can they be baptized in this sense? Going through the sea. 
Well, they got two walls of water they're passing through. There's something more going on than meets the eye. Even back when the, the, in the shadow that what well, it's telling here, when, when Israel was fleeing from their enemies and how they walked, walked on dry land to the other side. And then once their enemies that were behind them were trailing them, the sea closed in on their enemies. And thus they were separated. Thus there was a partition made. There was a partition made. And, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Notice they had two things here because there was a cloud that did follow them. They were baptized into this cloud and into the sea and were baptized to Moses. And it says, and did all eat the same? What kind of meat? Spiritual meat, not physical meat, but they went, what the things that they endured was there trying to feed them that spiritual meat, which they could never grasp onto. As you know, when they got over into the wilderness, when they got separated from their enemies, then they started murmuring and complaining, and most high eyes are going to bring us out here to uh, kill us. Don't forget that great miracle that how the Most High God baptized them, brought them through the Red Sea. They were able there. I mean, I bet that was horrible to them. You know, never seen nothing like that before in their lives. To see a miracle like this, the Most High God, to, you know, take a sea and then take up two walls of water and to, and to create dry land for them to walk on, to, to bring them out into the wilderness just to worship Him. The great lengths that He went through for His people. And that same cloud that they were baptized into, they seen the very thing hold off their enemies while this was preparing, while this great way of separation was preparing when the walls were being made for them to walk through, when the dry land between the two walls of water were being made. So it's an amazing thing that was going on there. And then when they got off in the wilderness, and they seen this great thing, yeah, they were happy and they were singing songs of deliverance and thanking the Most High God. Until the belly, until the belly started talking to this physical body started talking to them. They forgot all about the spiritual meat. Now they're wondering about physical meat. We need meat. We need water. We need this. We need that. Even though the Most High God was going to prove them, you know, He's going to provide for them anyway. He was not going to let them perish out in the wilderness. But there was a greater thing going on for Him preparing His people. I think even so, the same like figure is even going on to, until now. Because we, you know, it's been hot. It's been unbearably hot. And you know how this flesh reacts to this hot. It don't like it. It's got to seek comfort. It's got to seek cool. I've got to get out of it. I mean, what, what's going to happen when the times do come when we can't escape the heat? When there is no, nothing to quench our thirst. There's no food to eat. Who we're relying on then. As all this that went on before us, a great cloud of witnesses, as that immersed us into a more understanding of how we should be. And did eat, all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Another verse you always hear during baptism that's continually, it usually starts off the chain of verses that are read before someone is actually put to his death. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Because his people at that time were scattered amongst all nations. And the people had to go out and teach all nations. There are a lot of people that didn't hear, but the people that did hear, they come out of the nations. Even so now, what is going on? There is, the word is going out teaching all nations. I see, you know, a congregation here of a mixed multitude. And you out there on online church, a mixed multitude. And that's marvelous in our eyes. I, I got to look at it and go, Wow. As we are being scattered, and now we are being gathered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the what? 
name, there's that word baptizing, it, it actually has an action, going to, it has a verb tense to it, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And we know that the disciples, when they heard this command, they went out and baptized in the name of Jesus. That was the name. But there was something concerning this name, this baptizing. Baptized and baptizing. The baptized person was closely bound to or became the property of the one into whom, into whose name he was baptized. It also referred to whom he would be identified with. Therefore we are buried with him and to his death and to the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. You notice we read that verse, the likeness of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So we can understand now that baptism takes on a little bit more authority. It takes on a minute, little bit more uh, cohesiveness within our being. What actually took place in the heavenly by our outward deed of showing everybody that we have cut ourselves off from this world. That if we went down and then we come up, we passed through the waters. And they come out the other side and separated and made a proclamation to the whole world. We separated ourselves from the whole world and from our enemies. Our enemy was cut off from that time. The water swallowed them up and it took it on down the stream. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So again, baptized and baptizing. Noted them action words. The baptized person was closely bound to or become the property of the one into whose name. You hear that? Baptizing them in the name of. So this baptism actually puts on an ownership. It is derivative of an ownership. One into whose name he was baptized. It also referred to whom he would be identified with. Like it was said, they were baptized into Moses. Because he was the deliverer at that time. He was the one leading, in charge, leading his people out of bondage into freedom. Hallelujah. Matthew 3. Starting at verses 11 and 12. This is John here. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So what is John doing? He has a baptism, but this baptism is dealing with what? Repentance. That is his whole realm, that it was his whole vehicle of baptizing. Was after the realm of repentance. That was his work. The greatest prophet that Yeshua said ever lived. He was just birthed for this purpose. He prepared a way for the coming of Yeshua. And he prepared the way. Why? The very thing that was new on the land. The baptizing. The baptizing that was taking place. And you can see that there were people there who were sincerely getting baptized, and you also see there were snakes and vipers present, seeing what kind of liberty was going on at the baptizing. Hallelujah. This John again, it said, I'm going to read it again. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. We, are, we understand that baptism was an immersion. We also read it was a staining. It was a cleansing. It was a washing. So it has many facets to it. We've got to look at baptism more than what our Christian mindset that many of us have, have come out of has told us. And the very essence of Yeshua HaMashiach is more than just these words on a paper. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And when we read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see... 
that manifestation in the flesh. And we see even now that he prepared himself a body then, and he still has prepared himself a body now. We are the body of Christ. Like figure, like figure. We was baptized into who? Jesus. He was the one that authority we were baptized into. He is the king supreme. Hallelujah. He is the purchaser of our soul, the purchaser of our being. Before the foundation of the world, it says a lamb was slain, and he was that lamb that was slain. Why? For us to, for, to receive redemption for us. He tasted death for us. Hallelujah. Because that was the curse of sin. And I can't praise you. I don't want to go through that. But a lot of people have problems with that. Maybe because, I guess, on the aspect they hadn't truly been born again. What's that? Matthew 3.11. My pages are turning on me. Praise you John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, he was a what forerunner? He was preparing a way. He was heralding the arrival of the Lamb of Yah. He was making the ground and the furrow straight for those people that would receive the baptism of repentance so that they could go on farther. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we, are, we see here now a baptism taking place unto repentance. And then John says, now that you know after this, I do this unto you, there's one coming after me that is mightier than I. He's got shoes on. He's got a work that, you know, that my feet ain't been prepared for to, put, to be put into them shoes. And he said, hey, you know, after you've gone through this repentance, there's one coming after me that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we see there's a baptism of repentance, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and a baptism of fire. And then it says semicolon, after he says, and with fire. It says, whose fan is in his hand? And what's he doing with this fan? He's, 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 he's causing air to move for some reason. Air to move, fan is in, when you got a fan, you're doing something with a fan. And he will thoroughly purge what? His floor. What's he going to do this with? The fire. The fire. The fire. And it says, you know, Peter said, Cons don't consider this trial a, a strange thing as though it's come to try you. I mean, we, me, I, I talked to a, a lot of saints on the phone, and, you know, and they said, man, this fight is getting, it's getting something else. Well, he did say he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's the fire that does actually refine us. As we, we, we are vessels. That's all we are, saints. We are vessels. We've been molded from the foundation of the world for a certain purpose of the Most High Yah. And we are in His house. And He sets the vessels just as would please Him. The vessels there are to serve Him. And He did come serving just for the sake, serving us, to show us how we should serve. That's, that is a great humility. That is a great humility to be the Most High God, the creator of all things, and then come down and then put himself in flesh and become a little lower than the angels. And, and to, to, to suffer daily as we did with the same infirmities, the same pains, the same body, the same flesh that we were robed in. He felt it. He felt it as the days lingered on how, how much weaker it got, how much pain it had and what it would suffer under certain circumstances, what was going on in the conscience and in the mind, that was what he was really dealing with, because he was doing a work for something in the spirit. And he did have a forerunner, which we were reading here, that was preparing a way for him. 
I mean, he does everything in order, just like I said, after the order of Melchizedek. He's building again the tabernacle of David. He's restoring the old past. He's building up the old waste places. And that's all I've been actually been teaching over is the, that waste places that a lot of it has been laid desolate, been, been forgotten. The morning and the evening oblation has ceased in a lot of his people. And it's got to be restored again. Even though there ain't no physical temple now, now we are the temple of the Most High. And everything that have, took place and the very work that took place, the services, the daily ministrations of them Levites that were in the shadow, now they're being done in this. Being done in this. The same likewise tabernacle that was worldly sanctuary was built, uh, formed in the earth, formed on the earth. Now is, it is a likeness, the very image of what he was doing and performing in us. He's laid out the groundwork the same way we are. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Just as the tabernacle was laid out outer court, which was the flesh, then you moved into the sanctuary, the holy place, which is the soul realm, where the performance of all the daily ministration worked, and then the holy place of holies where one moves into the spirit now where the most high Yah dwells praise the most high Yah. so we got to you know put line upon line precept upon precept and our foundation always is yeshua hamashiach again whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner you I mean he's making a, we're all on the floor we're we're all upon the foundation of the Most High Eye. He's, he's, he's gone away preparing a place for us. And while He's preparing a place for us, He's preparing us for that place. And He has to. He's a faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Always. As you read all through Hebrews. As He continually keeps reverberating and reverberating of what, what the high priest is doing. And gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with what? Unquenchable fire. So what is the baptism of fire there for? To burn up the chaff. And that's the reason why we go through the things that we do in this walk. We don't consider it strange as though some strange thing has come to try us. No, the fire is there to get this chaff out of us. He's thoroughly purging his floor. He's building a place. And then again, he's building a people. And he's gathering his people. It says he's gathering the wheat. His wheat. Not nobody else's wheat, but his wheat. And to the garner, he's gathering them together. And then once he's gathering them together, he knows it's something else for saints to live together. I tell you what, it is a fire. Once we know everybody at that very onset, you know, a, a, a new broom sweeps good, but give it two, three months, years, and then all of a sudden you know, the hair lets down, and then the flesh shows out, and then everybody's got to live with everybody else's flesh, and we got to still go after the mind of Christ. We don't know each other after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we have a problem with that, of knowing each other after the Spirit, even though we have been baptized into this authority, and this baptism is showing us daily the way we should act with one another or be performing with one another. And because we're not getting to this point, then the fire, then the fire, then the fire, then the fire, burning up the chaff, burning up the chaff. Why is this going on? Why is that going on? Why is my mind like this? Why is this situation like it is? Well, we're his possession. And at any time, he's not going to have us in a place, in a situation that he does not want us in. He's not going to take his own possession and do with it uh, nastily or uh, abominably or ungodly way that you know our mind or heart may think as the people of Israel did when they were in the wilderness. Bring he out here you know, to kill us with famine and thirst. Boy, that's... And that was the shadow which he was showing us in the wilderness when he was bringing a people, a nation unto himself, trying to feed them with spiritual meat, 
trying to feed them with spiritual drink. Even so, it continues today where we still find in us murmuring and complaining. The chaff of murmuring, the chaff of complaining, the chaff of jealousy, the chaff of envy. And because this is found in us, and because, you know, he sees this within the vessels, he's got to turn the vessel upside down, shake it out, and then add the fire to it. Then in hopes that it may be burned up. So he's going to thoroughly purge his floor, so don't consider it strange. On this side of Christ, concerning the fiery trials, because they're coming. They are coming. They are coming, and they're not for our detriment. They are not for our death, but they're for our good. Yes. Because sometimes it seems like we're on a spiritual high. Everything is going right for us. We got joy in our heart. We got songs to sing of praise. We're on a high level. And the most high, I say, yeah, I see, son. But now, let's get some more fruit out of you. Clip, 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 clip. Start pruning. So he's going to have to thoroughly purge his floor. Because he's making a vessel of honor. Because you're a vessel of honor unto him. He's the great husbandman. Hey, you know, we've been led out to wicked husbandmen. Many of us can say we were in this wicked husbandman buildings called Christian churches and religions. But now he's taken out of us and now we're with the true husbandman. The wise master builder. The one that loves us. And we're in his field. When he, and we're in his love. We're on his floor. And he's taking care of us. He's watering us. He's feeding us. Even though there might be sometimes during the day the sun is beating down on us and we're wilting. He still brings rain in due time. Hallelujah. To raise us up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this baptism is going on continually. It don't happen once. It happens in stages. It happens as we mature, as we grow in Yeshua. As we can greatly look out there, you know, the plants that we plant out there in the ground. Yeah, we till up the ground. We plant the seed, we water it, and then, we, then it's, we're left up to who? To give the increase. And we see them plants out there go through much turmoil. Through much heartache. They go through heat, drought, dryness, insects. But you see, you know, they, after a time they build up a resilience to it and they get stronger from it. Just as we, people in the Most High Yah, in the garden. as from the beginning. Praise the Most High Yah for that. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 3. This is a wonderful thing because, you know, I get excited. I think of it, you know, I kind of look at it, the, the, the mechanics of the Most High God, the things that he's doing, you know, uh, in the spirit and the way he's doing it. It just gets exciting. And, it, you know, if we got knowledge of that going on and this going on, then we're not ignorant. We, we're knowing. So when these things come... We have a foundation to stand on. We won't be shaken. We won't be troubled. Because we can reflect on that, that which has been given unto us, that which we have received. A backbone of Christ. Hallelujah. First Peter 3, 20 and 21. I'm going to start at uh, verse 18 for clarity here. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to Yah, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of Yah, what did it? What long suffering Yah do? He waited in the days of Noah. Now it's bringing us back to Noah. There's something going on in Noah's day, and we're we're pretty much admonished, just as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So you most high Yah still in the long suffering, awaiting. 
The long suffering of Yah waited in the days of Noah while what? The ark was a preparing. There is something that's actually being prepared now. There is an ark of safety actually being prepared in this time and this hour. There is no new thing under the sun. We are being called into this ark. We not, might not see an actual ship or actual uh, a, something physically made, but there is something in the spirit that we've got to get into when the time comes. Because he said, you know, hey, come into my secret place. Come into my pavilion. Yet for a little while, while I pour out my wrath, while I pour out my indignation. He's got a place prepared for his people. Hey, he's appointed us unto salvation, not unto wrath. So he's going to take us and protect us, pull us out. If we're in the ark. Because the days are preparing themselves. We are in the days of preparing. We are. We are. While the ark was preparing, wherein few that, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now notice that it, it puts that out there first already to get our mind clicked in to, to a subject here. It says the like figure, wherein what is that like figure? Noah. In the days of preparing, Most High was long-suffering. And by cause of his obedience in preparing this ark, eight souls were saved through the judgment. The water was a judgment. Because the Most High I had seen, you know, the wickedness of man had just stacked so high that it was reaching up to heaven. It was crying out to heaven. Because his thoughts and his heart, intents of his heart was only evil continually. He couldn't say it was sin at that time because there was no law enacted at that time. But he called it wickedness the man had stacked up. So he called faithful Noah to build an ark. And even that, probably Noah, up till that time, I don't know if he had building skills or not, but I, I believe the Most High God gave him that wisdom to build. Just as he's given his people wisdom to build, just as he gave his people wisdom to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. He's given us wisdom in this time and this hour preparing ourselves to get into this safe haven. Hallelujah. Like figure, were to even baptism doth also now save us. How does this baptism save us? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, because we understand that when we're let down in the water, when we're immersed in the water, when we're brought in, that the sins go down and get washed away in that water. But this is talking about a little deeper, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but now we're dealing with a baptism as in the days of Noah, the same like figure, whereas we have a good conscience, but the answer of a good conscience toward Yah. How? How do we have this good conscience toward Yah? Why? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what happens also in death. Burial and resurrection, and all of a sudden our conscience is awakened. Our conscience is alive. All of a sudden now, that sin which was before that burial, that troubled us, that brought us down, that, that let us know that we were separated from the Most High Yah, brought us into the realm of repentance, and whereas we were baptized unto repentance, now we're moving forward and we're getting baptized in water unto death. Now we just deal with the the filth of the flesh, by the baptism of repentance. Now we're dealing with the washing of regeneration by the baptism that actually purges our conscience. And that's what should be going on after. Because when a person is born again, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But we see in ourselves a lot of superfluity of naughtiness rising up in our flesh that's at the time when we need to stand up and boldly proclaim that I am a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Because I remember that very day, that very time, you know, when I woke up to newness of life, like, whoa. Everything looked different. Everything smelled different. Everything was perceived different. And he asked, all of us has this testimony of beyond this point of baptism. Where it woke in our conscience, and it purged our conscience, where it washed our conscience, 
to this understanding of knowing who we are, that we were born again. Hallelujah. 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 Now, my page is turning on me again. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but what is saving us in that sense, but the answer of a good conscience. And who's it towards? The Most High Yah. Because when we were in our defiled state, our, our conscience was against the Most High Yah. And now that we're new creatures with new features, that our conscience now is toward Him and for Him. Hallelujah. Baptism reaches to this uttermost. Yeah. Yes, that was the, the, the figure. The, the very shadow was trying to bring us up unto. 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi. The realm of the flesh. With the law. It was not that the law was weak, but it was the flesh that was weak. So in that very same flesh that was weak, the Most High Yah come and rubbed Himself in that same flesh. Lived all them years, yet without sin, put himself, killed, died in the garden. Not my will, but thy will. He went through that baptism and then allowed himself to be impaled. He put that body of sin on that tree. We got to understand that separation. Thus, it behooved Christ to suffer and rise again the third day. What was He putting up on that cross? The body of sin. Like figure one, two, we go through. Amen. Well, we have this good conscience toward Yah. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By our own resurrection. By our own living unto Him. He has begotten us again into a lively hope. Hallelujah. Let's go now. Genesis. We're going to talk about this preparing of the ark. <laughs> Genesis 6.13. Genesis 6.13. It says, And Yah said unto Noah, The end of all what? Flesh. Notice that. We gotta, whenever you're reading your word here, your Bible, take note, take it slow, because there's key words that actually will open up your understanding if you take time to you know, just take them into your mouth and chew on them a little bit. Digest them a little bit, because they have flavor. This word has flavor. Yeah, because I, 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 there's a promise, you know, if you come in, you know, and uh, start supping with this, you know, and then you get a knock on the door, you know, which most high God wants to come and sup with you as you're supping in this word. And he comes in and while he's supping you, he's going to talk with you. Yeah, while you're eating. Oh, hallelujah. It does happen. Oh, yeah. Even though he's the one that prepared the meal that you're set down to. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just get your knives and your forks and your spoon ready. Oh, yeah. Praise the Most High, Yah. And Yah said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. Why? Because the wickedness of man, his thoughts and his imaginations was only evil continually. And he had to deal with what? Flesh. Is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence. How can the earth be filled with violence? The inhabitants of the earth are filled with violence. And because the inhabitants of the earth are filled with violence, then the earth is filled with violence. Through them. Who are the them? The flesh. That were vehicles of violence. And behold, I will destroy them with what? The earth. Then he told Noah, Make thee an ark, of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt, notice there in yellow, pitch it within. There's an action going on. And without, with pitch. I wonder what this pitch is. Because you remember in former definitions, it, 
it was telling us that baptism was also a staining. A staining. But he's telling Noah here, when you make this ark, you're going to pitch it within and without, with pitch. And he's, not, and he's liking everything to while the ark was a preparing. Even so, the light figure where until now doth baptism even save us. Because we understand it, if it wasn't for Noah building this ark, building this, this vessel to get the people through judgment and everything that he'd done in preparing, because most high I waited for the preparing of this ark, and while the ark was finished, only eight souls were saved through the judgment. But this ark that was prepared by obedience that lifted up Noah above the judgment of the water and had them to pass through the judgment unscathed, saved, redeemed out of all the earth. And they only found one righteous man. That was Noah. Noah and his house. So he's going to overflow the whole earth with water. Does that so? You know, when we go down into the water, the water overwhelms us. And we go under. Then we come back out, though. Whereas in this judgment, the wicked, the violent ones, did not go through. Just as in the same thing when Egypt, the Egyptians were heavily with chariots and horses and footmen going after uh, Israel to get back their slaves, to get back their people that helped them build all their great emphases. If the waters closed on them, but the people of Yah were able to pass through the waters to the other side safe and redeemed, sanctified and set apart now from Egypt by that very partition of the sea. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. And they make jokes about that. And what is gopher wood? Well, that's that kind of wood you tell somebody to go for. But, you know. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it. That's an action, that's a verb there. Within, you've got to pitch it within, and without with pitch. So now, what is this pitch? Hebrew 37.22. The word call far. The primitive root to cover especially with bitumen. It was a type of uh, asphalt type thing that was actually a sealer. Figurative to expiate or condone, to placate or cancel, means to appease, make an atonement, cleanse, disannul, forgive, be merciful, pacify, pardon, to pitch, purge, away, put off, make reconciliation. Out of that one word pitch that is used, the very action verb, we're dealing with the verb here. Call far. The action that actually the pitch should be doing. The actually he was doing something physically, but this is what's going on spiritually. Again, take the word kafar again. I took it out of two lexicons here. 37.22, kafar. To cover. Purge, make an atonement, make reconciliation, cover over with pitch, to coat, cover with pitch, to cover over, pacify, propitiate. When I'm reading these words, uh, the other things should be coming to your mind concerning Christ, especially in the New Covenant. A lot of these words are reverberating, reverberating, reverberating. That's the reason why we're using Noah as a, uh, a foundation here. Whereas in the days that the ark was a preparing, then it even so even now baptism doth also now save us. So he's pitching it within and in pitching it without. On the inside of the ark, he's pitching it. On the outside of the ark, he's going to pitch it. To cover, pacify, appreciate, to cover over, atone for sin, make atonement. To cover over, atone for sin, and persons by legal rights to be covered over, to make atonement for, to be covered, to be atoned for. That's the verb. Pitch it within and without with pitch. Now here's pitch. 37, 24. Kofir. 
And it's from 3722. All these Hebrew words, they feed off one another, or are derivatives of one another. Anytime you get a lexicon, especially the Strong's, it will actually chain you to other words for the very basic words that it comes from, that it builds off of. Properly, a cover that is literally like a village as covered in, specifically bitumen, used for coating, and the henna plant as used for dyeing. I'm like, whoa, that's kind of unique. Dyeing, because we read in previous definitions, it was a staining. Staining. Figurative, a redemption price. Bribe, camphor, pitch, ransom, satisfaction, sum of money, village. Again, in another lexicon, Kofar again, 3722, and they, they agree. Price of a life, ransom, bribe, asphalt, pitch as a covering, the henna plant, name of a plant, henna, village. Praise the Most High God. Building upon that. Exodus 2 3. Read this real quick as, you know, just a little sub side thing there. You know, it's uh, the deliverer Moses. There was a time when he was born that went an edict out that all children two and under should be killed. But there was something that saved Moses in the time of that great affliction. I'm going to read it. Verse 1. Moses is born. And there went a man of the house of who? Levi. And took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a what? Goodly child. She hid him three months. Same like figure. Christ had to be hid in Egypt for three months. Or for the time that he had to be hidden until... Herod died to the one that produced the edict to kill all children below two died. She hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, when the heat got on, when they were actually closing in on her, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags in the river's bank. And this is the very thing that preserved Moses' life. Because she pitched that ark within and without. And if it wasn't for that pitch being pitched within and without, that vehicle, that ark would not be seaworthy. It could not pass over the judgment without that very action. Praise the Most High. Let me see if I can bring you another instance here. Something that... Uh, it happens naturally. Something that happens uh, pretty neat. Just say, you know, I kind of liken this to uh, uh, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, but, but not being born of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Thank you. Praise the Most High Yah. You know, I liken that to, you know, most the visible things of the Most High Yah are clearly seen by the things that are made. And how many things that go on during the day that we clearly don't pay attention to and let it pass over that, you know, Most High Yah is trying to teach us in those things. And He, and he, and he kind of teaching us something in the very concept of conception when a man and a wife come together. Especially when the Word and uh, the, the one that's supposed to receive the word come together. The very word that we heard, the very word that we heard preached that awakened us unto newness of life, the very word that we heard that propelled us to die, to go unto the baptism of repentance and then be baptized in the, in the water, the very word that caused obedience in us to move in this direction unto newness of life. It was that word, that seed, that the Most High Yah had planted, uh, had meant to be planted from the foundation of the world, but he had it to germinate at a certain time in his field, just so it is in, in the end of time. You know, the, the field is great. The harvest is plenteous. 
But he said the laborers are few. But he had planted this very thing that we're in the end time now from the very beginning. Hallelujah. Now look at the very point of conception. The woman has an egg. Pretty much it's a one cell thing. This is before, you know, actually uh, a human comes into being. We can look at this on this plane. We can take it also into the spiritual, especially with the born-again believer. You know, as I say, the word with faith, they come together and they become an action. Just the same thing, a woman has a one cell, she carries the egg, but the man carries a one cell organism called a sperm. And we know in the Greek that the, the word word is rendered as sperma. Now, I'm not going to go off on no Eddie Long thing about that, but I'm going to stay holy with it. But it's amazing at the point of conception, and we can kind of take this over into the spirit, what actually happened was happening in the spirit with us. Because when these two come together, that's one cell, and that's one cell. But the only way this thing can become, you know, a different body both of them have to die. So once this sperm penetrates the egg, and only the egg can receive one. And once it makes it inside here, this one dies, this one dies. And then upon that moment of death, this one, when it dies, it releases all that it is within the other body. It starts staining the egg. And the two coming together, because each one of them has a set of chromosomes. And, you know, in chromosome, the word is soma, means a body, a body of color. And once, you know, these two die in one another, they release the essence of each other's being or each other, whoever had uh, the egg and the sperm, they bring it together and they become one cell. So everything that uh, was uh, pretty much composed of all the, what the sperm was, and everything was com composed of the egg, they become one. They become one. And it takes this to stain this. And once that staining takes place, and then the cells start dividing. Then it becomes a human. Again, kafar, a primitive root to cover specifically with bitumen, figuratively to expiate or condone, to placate or cancel, appease. And now I'm drawn in, especially we're still with baptism, make an atonement. Cleanse, disannul, forgive, be merciful, pacify, pardon, to pitch, purge away, put off, reconcile, reconciliation. Leviticus 23. And we wonder why we're going through these feast days, huh? Feast days start off with seed time, and they end with harvest. They end with harvest. Just as, you know, our, our walk began with baptism unto repentance, and then we're baptized into water, and then we baptized and received the Holy Ghost, and we're going through the baptism of fire. You know, it, it, it's a continual, gradual process. It's all working for the self-same thing. It's all working to a harvest day. Walking to a time of gathering. Just as we see, we've got a time allotted out here where we can plant and a time when we can harvest. And the Most High Yah has set them boundaries. Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. And we know the day of atonement is in the midst of the last great feast. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls in offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. We're still dealing with pitch, still dealing with baptism, with staining, the same thing that, you know, the very thing that the Most High Yah had had purpose for us in the beginning when his word come in 
you know, we died, and we understood that he died, and we got to understand when we die and he dies, we come together and we become a new creature because of that dying process. And it's because his word stained us and is continually staining us, staining our conscience, staining our being. What was that staining doing? It is preparing us and building us and making us what he wants it to be. Word, Hebrew word for day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Kippur is the word for atonement. And it says from 3722, and 3722 was our word pitch. How far? Atonement. So you can understand that the Most High Yah has this stuff intermingling, I mean, greatly woven within itself, trying to teach us something, how great and marvelous are his works, how righteous and majestic he is, the great things that he's doing in us. I mean, it has, it has length, it has width, it has depth, it has height. It's more than just an act. He wants us to know what's going on because he's preparing us the same things. Same things. Same things. Atonement. Just as in the tabernacle, one time a year, the priest would go in, do his, do his work here at the altar, wash up at the labor, and then he would enter into the Holy of Holies to make the atonement. But he took one thing into the Holy of Holies with him. It was blood. It was blood. And it's blood. And what did he do with this blood? He sprinkled it. He stained the mercy seat with it. He stained the mercy seat with it. When the Most High Yah that was dwelling between the cherubims looked down, all he saw was the blood. Even though right below that mercy seat there was two tables of stone, a golden pot of manna, and Aaron's rod did bud it. Only thing that he saw now, for that whole year now, was that blood making reconciliation. That staining right below him, something gave its life so that others may live. Death, burial, resurrection. The essence of baptism. Mark 10. It's amazing how the Most High Yah had prepared His disciples for this very work. Because last time when I uh, ministered on tabernacle, we went through the process of what the priest would go through, the outer court getting to the sanctuary, the holy place, and to the Holy of Holies, the, the, the actual pattern, the, the, the way that he would officiate himself. And he did the same thing with his disciples. He was preparing them something. So we ought, we ought to consider the things that go on in our life as a preparation for greater things. Just as he did with the disciples. Mark 10, starting at verse 35. It's an amazing story, but it's a uh, real, uh, real wonderful testimony. And James and John the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. That's amazing. They come up to the Most High asking that, you know. And he said unto them, here's the most Yeshua coming back to them and answering them, What would ye that that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Everything that you see me suffering, everything that you see me in travail with, everything that you see me acting upon this earth, 
This baptism you see me going through. Now, what you're asking, now are you able to go through what I go through? To, for me to sit on the right hand of the Father in glory? Because you're asking, either asking Him, one to sit on His left hand, one to sit on His right hand. And He, and he brings up to Him, you know, you're going to drink the same cup, everything that, you know, I, that, that I am consuming that's going into me? Are you able to drink from the same cup? Are you going to be able to endure the things that I've been enduring and going to endure and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Notice what he's talking to the disciples here. He's talking a greater depth about baptism. He's talking to us a greater depth of baptism. And they said unto him, we can. Whoa. And you, when we see the testimony that James and John, they did go through the same cup, they drunk the same cup, and they, they took of the same baptism. And he basically, we can actually look at ourselves and say to ourselves, you know, are we worthy to drink from the cup? Because, you know, when we come to Passover... We're drinking of that cup. We are. We're, we're, we're taking of that spiritual meat and that spiritual drink. Starting over, that's the beginning of our journey. Passover starts our journey. And it's amazing, these feast days, I don't know why nobody wants to, a lot of people want to cast them off and say they're done away with. No, they're trying to tell us something. They are a road map of what is coming if we just take the time to step back and look at it for what it's meant, for what it was instituted for. And Jesus said unto them, we, and they said unto him, we can. And Jesus said unto them, ye shall indeed drink of the cup I drink of, and with the baptism I am baptized with shall ye be baptized. But he said, but sit on my right hand, on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. First Peter. Four. First Peter four. One and two. For as much then. As Christ has suffered for us, how? In the flesh. Are we going to drink from the same cup? Are we going to be baptized with the same baptism that He is? For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same, what? Mind. Around where the conscience is. For he that has suffered in the flesh, when he suffers in the flesh, what happens? He has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That is the part of that conscience being purged. So that now, even though that Paul said, I see something warring in me. Oh boy, one thing warring against me. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. But now I just finally understand, yeah, with the flesh, I'm going to serve the law of sin, but with my mind, now I'm going to serve the law of the Most High God. With this thing that has been purged. He didn't say nothing about this flesh. No, it's going back to where it came from, dirt. Yes, it is. But to the will of Yah. Philippians 3. Eight through ten. Paul here says, starting at verse eight, Philippians three eight, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss. What? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, why? That I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. John 13. And then we're going to talk about how Jesus was preparing his disciples for something. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. It says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to what? Betray him. Knowing that, and Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, said he rises from supper, Yeshua here, and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And he's doing this, what, at Passover. He, he's now showing to the disciples the entrance now. Disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherein he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Then Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And he said, Jesus said unto him, he that is washed needeth not to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are all clean, but not all. See, Jesus, Yeshua was preparing his disciples at the brazen labor before they actually went in to do the work of the sanctuary in the holy place. He was performing that act upon his disciples, getting them ready to go into the work, to go to do the service. Because not only the uh, Levitical priesthood had ceased and the uh, Melchizedek priesthood had, had just pretty much regained itself or reinstated itself, the Most High Yah was getting his disciples ready for this very, very thing. Same priesthood getting them washed at the labor. He is washing his disciples. They must be washed before they actually can enter in. And you know, after that, you know, it was not long after that, after he, after he died, he resurrected, he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait a certain time, that they actually went into the upper room, stayed there for the time, and then the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit came down upon them. Hallelujah. It's an amazing mechanic, an amazing thing the Most High God does in order. Beautiful. Beautiful. Revelation 19. Still on baptism. And a lot of us probably never understood baptism to this degree, have we? Yes, to this depth. I think it's a good thing that, you know, we understand things at a more graver level. That gives us a more of appreciation of what the Most High Yah has done. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. if, you know, if we were in here continually every day, I mean, every Sunday, getting a sermon on John 3.16, and that's it, how shall we grow? If we, don't, if we just stay at that point, if we don't go beyond 
the impaling of our Yeshua and his resurrection, what shall we be? What shall we be? Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Who? Yeshua makes war? Yes. His eyes were a flaming, was, were a fla- as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called what? The Word of Yah. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Vesture dipped in blood. Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed with a vesture, and I got the word dipped now in uh, italicized or in prominence there. Dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. What is this dipped? Bapto. Another derivative, huh, of baptism. A primary verb to wham, that is, cover wholly with a fluid. New Testament only in a qualified or specific sense is literally to moisten part of one's person by implication to stain as with a dye. And there's one song that uh, was sung today that we sing in our hearts. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Though it's red, though it's red. It does something amazing. Isaiah 1.16 says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve their press, judge the fallers, plead for the widow, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, saith the Most High, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, thou shalt be as wool. So them saints that's following with the Most High Yah, the one that has his vesture dipped, baptized in blood, and as we've been baptized in blood, notice that we appear white. Righteousness of the saints. Why? Because of the staining of the blood. Being baptized in the blood. And that's what we, another thing that we go through daily when we're fighting against the wickedness, the lust, the temptations of our mind. We're dealing with also a blood baptism daily. Praise the Most High Yah. I pray that most, y'all got a little bit more understanding here about baptism, what it means to us, what it's done for us, what is continually doing for us what it's going to be doing in the get us to the kingdom that is a beautiful thing the the work that the most high are doing through this little vehicle called baptism and staining us with his word because we got to hear it to be stained and the only way that we can receive the word we got to die to ourselves so that in the, that this word can be mixed with faith and then once it mixed with faith then it has action it has manifestation and them that believe shall cast out devils that shall heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Hallelujah. Why? Because of what all this work going on through baptism. Hallelujah. Bless you all. Praise. Bless you all. Family out there on online church, love you very much. Pray that there's been a, something to help you, to edify you, to get you more appreciation of what Yeshua is doing as a high priest what he has done and the work that he's doing, the manifestation of the word through this very act, as it is awesome in our eyes. Yes, it is. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and sing praises unto his name on Most High. I can understand why David had so much of praise and, a, and a up, 
rightness in his heart for the Most High because he understood what the Most High Yah was doing, the friend of the Most High Yah. And that's another thing that's being established in the tabernacle of Dave. He's trying to raise up praise and worship in us again. Because you're trying to get us in prayer, in fasting, trying to rear up the things that have been laid desolate, the things that have been laid old and forgotten. He's building it again. He's building it up to a tabernacle of David. Hallelujah. And his seed was, the seed of David was Yeshua. Now we are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we thank the Most High Yah for that. We had no doings in it. Without Him, we can do nothing. This whole thing has been orchestrated by Him, and by Him alone we have no boast in ourselves. All we can do is say, Thank you, Most High. I am yours. Do with me as thy will. Not my will, as Yeshua said when he was in that baptism experience, that, that blood experience in the garden, when he was baptized and finally come up into newness of life and said, Not my will, but thy will be done. And then after that, he said, the, 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 the impaling, being crucified, was probably a piece of cake. No wonder there was no guile found in his mouth. Because he took care of it right there in that garden of Gethsemane. Yes, he did. He fought with the very same thing that we fought with daily. Man who knew no sin that became sin. And that man that became sin, he put that man on the cross. Took him out of the way. Didn't take the law out of the way. Took the things that were contrary to us from keeping that very law that keeps us with him. As it is written, for us to sin, we've got to go outside of the body to sin. And what is gives us the knowledge of sin? What gives us the knowledge of transgression? What is that boundary that lets us know? The law. So it is spiritual and it is good, it is holy, it is righteous, it is just. Praise the Most High Yah for that. Ah, blessed Heavenly Father, we do bless you and thank you for your word. Thank you for leading and guiding us continually. Your word is rich. It's a good, bountiful table to eat at. Do bless you and praise you and pray for the days ahead, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, hearing, ear, and the seeing eye. Help us to guide our feet to walk this path so we're getting closer to home. We do bless you and commend all things in your care. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless you all. Bless you all, saints. Praise the Most High Yah.